after several years of absence and illness, well, I congratulate you for being among the most fortunate Catholic group in all the United States, if not in all the world. Because you have here not only a fine executive in the person of Father Hayes, or one of the holiest priests in this diocese, or any other diocese, who is so regarded by his fellow priests, and he's so esteemed by me personally because I've watched very carefully how he has conducted the welfare of this beautiful parish. I come here today on the occasion of a happy, happy moment in the history of the Catholic Church. We know the occasion for Vatican II when it was summoned by John the 23rd. The venerable, holy John the 23rd had been the papal nuncio of Paris, who also had been the cardinal archbishop of the Venetian parish, Venetian diocese. But uh, that was unimportant compared to what had happened at Paris. At that time, as of today also, Paris, despite the United Nations, is the political center of the world. It's not London. It's not Washington. It's not Brussels. It is Paris. And while there, John had very attentive ears. You heard what was going on in all the chancelleries of the world. He knew why all this dissatisfaction was so rampant in Europe particularly. That is, dissatisfaction amongst the younger Catholics, or so-called Catholics. He knew that every generation and a half, the boys of Europe were summoned to the colors of their various flags to become victimized on battlefields for no good reason. Of course, politicians always have reasons, but politicians always have been liars. He also knew that the laity in Europe blamed the Catholic hierarchy for not protesting. And he had rumors, as everyone else in Europe had, and we in this country also had them, that the Catholic Church men, not church, please distinguish the word. The Catholic Church men, from the highest to the lowest in many instances, had uttered the cry of all aid for Russia in World War I and World War II. That was unprovable. But nevertheless, that was the rumor that circulated all over Europe, a rumor that I well knew, and when John was summoned to participate in the College of Cardinals election for a pope, when John was elected, one of the first things he did, and this is according to reliable information, was to examine some of the papers in the Vatican to find out what truth supported this 
terrible charge of all aid for communism on the part of high ecclesiastics. He discovered it. I've since printed part of it in the book that I wrote. The rest of it will not be forthcoming until two years from now. I have the rest of it. <coughs> After the venerable, blessed Pope John had read this, he knew there must be another Vatican Council. He knew it had to be. And he summoned it, and his forces were unprepared to handle it. But the forces of his antagonists in the church... I'm not going to mention these priests by name. They're well known to all priests, though. I could, but I won't from a pulpit. They were well organized, and they disrupted Vatican II in part because they controlled the news media. They controlled the radio. They controlled the television throughout the world. And what you read in America was not always the truth about Vatican II. God took Pope John almost in the midst of that council. The illness overtook him. And finally, our blessed father and father of all, Paul VI, ascended the throne and he well knew what bothered poor John his predecessor the matter for which John had called the council had not been settled it had caused confusion so much confusion that the leftists came to the surface so much so that the rightists those defending the Pope were decried. So much so that the people of every country, particularly of America, were misled and are still being misled. So much so that the little sisters in many convents placed in their community rooms the picture of Tyard de Chardon, whom all educated persons knew was a traitor to the Catholic Church, to the Holy Father, and to the traditions of the apostles. But that was all beclouded in confusion. Paul VI knew that the confusion had to be dispelled. Paul VI waited for this holy year to reassemble a synod of bishops who terminated their findings just yesterday. Who clarified the position of the Catholic Church just yesterday. who let the light shine in on Vatican II so that the whole world can read it just yesterday. It's a new day for the Catholic Church militant in this nation. It's a new day when the Confusionists will be decried. Now, in the United States, we have no business relying upon the public media for news that is reliable on matters theologic or on matters historic inside the Catholic Church. You have no expression in this country that is worthwhile in the public news media. For example, just recently, 
His Eminence, Cardinal Cook of New York, and his Chancery Office, were confronted with a case where an upstart German so-called theologian dressed as a layperson, I understand he's been invited to speak here in Detroit, went to New York and to the dismay of all informed clergymen berated the Pope and the papalism of the Catholic Church berated the very essence of our doctrines and was accorded a full page practically in the New York Times. Cardinal Cook wrote a reply. Cardinal Cook saw personally that the reply was delivered to the editor-in-chief of the New York Times and they refused to publish one word of it. That's history. Maybe the newspaper people in Detroit don't know about that. But you don't get the other side of the story that favors Paul VI. You don't get the other side of the story that favors the tradition of the apostles. You don't get the other side of the story that upholds the glorious church militant. On October 4th of this year, there's an abbot in Paris who writes a daily article for Le Figaro, the most prominent paper in Europe, outside the London Times. And this gentleman, together with one of the cardinals of the Catholic Church who whose name I dare not mention here in the pulpit, has seen fit for the past four years or more to maintain that there are two viewpoints of the church established by Christ, one that is outmoded, the other that is about to be born. The very, very patient Paul VI kept silent. The Cardinal of Paris kept silent. He could not berate a fellow Cardinal. But finally, matters attain such prominence throughout the world that two weeks ago, the most scholarly, erudite, and capable cardinal in the Catholic Church, Cardinal Danielu, a Jesuit, together with the Observatory Romano and its editor, that's the papal paper, both attacked their fellow cardinal the first time in over 300 years that such an attack was made. And they exposed him. The Catholic Church, of course, teaches that the priest is the divine creation. The Catholic Church, of course, teaches that to thee do I give the keys of the kingdom of heaven, feed my lambs and feed my sheep, expressed in the singular and not in the plural, expressed to one apostle and not to all apostles, expressed to Peter but not to Andrew, James, and John and the others, he who heareth you heareth me, said the founder of our church. But this newborn cardinal, this newborn abbot, using the public media of Le Figaro, the most prominent paper in Paris, and other papers that copied it, 
try to tell us that the new religion of Catholicism comes from beneath. It comes from the people up to the priests. The old religion and its teaching that religion and faith comes from above down to the priest must be cashiered, said he. Well, until Cardinal Danny Lou, as I say, the most erudite of all the cardinals we have, and until the Observatory Romano, the most important of all Catholic papers we have, took up the cudgels, you were confused. But stop being confused this morning. Three popes who have forbidden the books of Tyler de Chardon even to be housed within a Catholic convent or a Catholic rectory paid no attention to what? Pius the Twelfth, John the Twenty Third, Paul the Sixth said. None of them paid attention to what Cardinal so-and-so said, whose name I will not mention. They preferred to stand by him and his heresy, which is nothing more than a revival of Jansenism, than accept the word of the Holy Father, than accept the word of Jesus Christ, than accept the word of the first Pentecost message that came down in tongues of fire upon these men, enabling them not only to speak the materialities of many languages, but the spiritualities of God's language called truth. I come here this morning to bid you stand by the Pope. Stand by the findings of this synod whose work was concluded yesterday. This morning's paper that I read before coming here tells us how this matter of celibacy, for example, merely squeaked through. That's a lie. It was almost unanimous that you cannot have a married clergy and have the missionary activities of the church militant that unfortunately was more or less silent this last 40 years or more. But we're no longer the church cowardly. We're no longer the church confused today. We again are the church militant. We're again ready to fight for truth. Fight for the Holy Spirit. And to take up the cudgels, the weaponry, which St. Paul so ably described. So therefore, revive your devotions to the Mother of God, the protectress of our church. Revive your devotions to the holy sacrifice of the Mass, and let them no longer deceive you that the Mass is a meal. I remember Hilary Belloc, who was one of my collaborators in social justice. One day Hillary said to me, Father, do you know the most important adverb in the whole Bible? I said, Hillary, it never entered my mind to question it. And he says it's the word after. I said, why do you say so? He says, you know, we're in England we're beginning to confuse the Last Supper with the First Supper. The Last Supper, said Hillary. What did that mean? It was the Last Supper of the Old Testament. The Last Supper of the Old Regime. 
And if you read carefully, he says that after the supper, after the supper, then he took bread into his venerable hands, blessed and broke, and said, eat all of this. After the supper, he took the chalice and said, this is my blood of the New Testament, not the Old Testament. The Last Supper, so boldly painted, was the last of the Old Testament. The new supper, ten minutes later, was the sacrifice of the mass. The most important adverb in the, all the Old Testament. Get that again and let no one stand up and tell you, as I heard last week at a funeral in New York, that the Mass is a meal, and everybody was invited up to participate, Catholic, Protestant, and Jew, in the distribution of the species of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there was a little sanctuary boy, about seven years of age. There he held a great chalice in his hand, following a priest who dipped bread into it and sprinkled it over the floor as well as giving it to the people. What a sacrilege. Perpetrated by people who don't know the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Perpetrated by people who don't know the Last Supper was the Last Supper of the Old Testament. And that the Mass is the First Supper of the New Testament. Things like that. But however... I have little time here today except to advance you in the pursuit of your faith. You know, the end of the world hasn't come. You know, it's a truism in our Catholic religion that you can cast your faith away, but if you do so, say farewell to hope. Say farewell to charity. For the three of them hang together like the Blessed Trinity. Destroy one and you destroy all. Hold one and you must hold all. And today you're almost ready to say, where's our hope? Your hope is in this church. Your hope is at that altar. Your hope is in men like Father Hayes. Your hope is in men like the fighting Cardinal Danny Liu. Your hope is not in the secular press. Your hope is not in politicians. You know, these are peculiar days. We have so-called conservatives and so-called liberals in politics, so-called Republicans, so-called Democrats in politics. They're all the same. We have an administration in Washington today, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial, who are the most outright extremists that we've ever had in the history of this country. It was they who supported the abortion laws. It was they who supported the integration laws and the busing of school. It was they who did what Lenin and Stalin told years ago, that you must force the Kulaks and you must force the rest in one country, in one school, in one assemblage. And we lived in America to see that effort made by the so-called conservatives. Strict, strict Marxism. Strict, strict Marxism. Stand by your children. Stand by a new bishop that be coming forward in this country, Archbishop Manning of Los Angeles, who took it upon himself two weeks ago to revive the old concept of the nunnery, to revive the old concept of the sisterhood. And he's had more postulants coming to him for this than he can handle. We need a revision of the new priesthood, too. We need a revision under Cardinal John Wright, our friend, 
of the priesthood all over America, for he's in charge of it under the Pope. We need new celibates. We need your fighters, church militant people, who bow before no secular people. After all, we Catholics, and Protestants who are Christians in this country, we feel badly for the past several years. In my estimation, we've spent $1,750,000,000, we Catholics and Protestants, on the conversion of China alone. And you and I have lived to see the day when that has been obliterated. And recently we spent the lives of 50,000 men in Vietnam to oppose the communists. But we've faded off the Christianity of China. We've had 50 million martyrs in China. And we've had our hand extended to the bloody nail. After five... 50,000 men of our boys were murdered in a useless war in Vietnam and we're going over to thank Mayo for murdering our boys. Wonderful. So they tell us that we Catholics and Protestants in this country are voiceless because they've adopted a law here where the rights of the minority take precedence over the rights of the majority. Robespierreism, Voltaireism, Rousseauism, French Revolutionaryism that lasted only 11 years in Paris and was overthrown by Napoleon in 1800. But we have it in our country. If anybody has a reason to complain, we Christians, both Catholics and Protestants, can complain for putting a billion seven hundred and fifty million dollars down the sewer of communism and our men martyred, my friend Armand Jocks, a priest done to death there, my friend Bishop Ford of the Marinos done to death there. My friend Archbishop O'Gara done to death when he come home from there. You forget these things. And yet, our leftist government that talks rightest out of its left side of its mouth has become hostile to us. Let's start fighting, Christians, and get rid of this abomination where one woman bringing suit to a court of the United States government can oust God from the school on the pretext of separation of church and state, a proposition with which I agree. But they've twisted it. No one ever said the separation of God and state. Go out of the church then. Thank God that our synod is over. Thank God it has eradicated the confusion. Thank God that we're on our way again and we're going to be proud to be Christians and to follow him who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believeth in me and is baptized I will raise him up on the last day. God bless you. Stand by Father Hayes and such wonderful priests as he has here with him. They're God-given. Thank you. Made at the 12 noon mass on November the 7th, 1971 at the Shrine of the Little Flower. In one or two places in the tape, you will hear Father Coughlin refer to Pius VI, and he really refers to Paul VI.
beloved pastor and my dear friends and parishioners of the shrine. It is indeed a singular pleasure for me to be present here today. This is my home. And I hope one day that my corpse will be carried from the doors of this church. This is an auspicious occasion, quite accidentally calendared, because just yesterday, the wheel of time turned on the leftists and confusionists God is in his heaven. God is in the Vatican. God is in the voice of our beloved Pius VI. And eventually, the enemies of Christianity have been routed. Perhaps you don't know of all this. And I'm taking this occasion to tell you some history in which you should be interested and to inspire you to carry on in the traditions that made the Catholic Church great throughout the world. It will be greater. It will not be obliterated. The sun shall fall from heaven first before the successor of Peter will be subdued under the heel of materialism. Now this is the story. From the time of Leo XIII, it was very evident that a new effort should be made by the hierarchy of the world to preach the gospel of Christ. To preach it without fear. To preach it even though it be in contradiction to the gospel of mammon which created 175 wars in Europe alone over the last 300 years. To preach it in deference to no political party to no king, prince, emperor, or dictator, because in matters spiritual there is but one king, the king of truth, the king of love, Jesus Christ our Savior. For many years, There was a spirit of subservience on the part of many hierarchs in our church, fearing to offend the rulers of France and Germany and England and Portugal and Spain and whatnot. For many years, the church seemed to be satisfied to rest upon the laurels of the great fathers of antiquity the great popes of the Vatican, the great scholars of Paris University and elsewhere, the great missionary endeavors of many of the order men in the Catholic Church. Unfortunately, that was not enough. No one dares rest on laurels. He who does begins to rot. I think it was Pericles who said that about 400 years before Christ. And 
And so, following the birth of Marxism, following the rebellion against the rulers of Russia and the ascendancy of Stalin and Lenin, the challenge was given to the archbishops and the bishops under the Pope to do something about the new age in which we were living. Very little was done. Probably it was the darkest years in the whole history of the papacy. The latitude, the inactivity, the blindness of those who should be our leaders hoping that tomorrow's sunrise would see better times for Christ and his kingdom. That was an idle dream. Because after all, we belong to the church militant. Let no one tell you that we belong to the church pacific. That we belong to the church cowardly that we belong to the church subservient, that we belong to the church who grovels on our knees before the false dictators and politicians who created all the wars of the past. We're the church militant, as St. Paul said, but not with the nuclear weapons, not with the atomic weapons, not with the weapons of hate, of fear, of anger, but with the weapons of the helmet of faith and the sword of the Word of God. Well, we grovel from worse to worse, particularly since 1891 down until four years ago. Oh, we had lovely popes, we had wonderful popes, but there was a lack of cooperation, a lack of militancy, a lack of spirit among the Catholic population of the world. We became too prosperous, we built too many churches, things were too affluent for all of us. And as a result, we watched Europe go Marxist. We watched the different forms of Marxism under the names of communism, Nazism, fascism, and international banking, which is a form of Marxism, grow and increase. Meanwhile, Rumors were aloft in Europe amongst the Catholic boys and girls particularly. I heard them on the streets of Copenhagen, of Oslo. I listened to them in Rotterdam and Amsterdam because I made it my business to approach the youth there. And they all had the same story, be they from England or Ireland or Belgium or France or where. Why should we be cannon fodder every generation and a half for those who said they were claiming the world for peace and were leading us into destruction? The youth really had something to complain about if you count the years of warfare. Now this rumor was very, very vibrant in Paris. Paris then and now is the center of the political life of the world. It's not Washington, it's not London, it's not Moscow, it's Paris. There's where the pulse is felt. And at Paris there was a venerable cardinal He was Pope John the Twenty-Third. 
And he listened to the ugly rumor that the Catholic Church and its prelates and higher officers had uttered the phrase of all aid to Russia at the beginning of World War II. Those who heard it in this country scouted the idea. Many Europeans refused to accept the idea. But it persisted to be the rumor throughout Europe and was down to the ranks of the boys and the girls and their ugly hair and ugly dress and ugly manners on the streets of these cities I mentioned before. Eventually, Pius XII died. Meanwhile, from Venice, journey. John the 23rd to the conclave of Cardinals. Lo and behold, he was elected Pope. And one of the first things he did was to investigate the files of the Vatican to see what truth there was in this rumor so widespread. Lo, he found it was true. It was more than a rumor. Well, I had the occasion to be the first one in this country to publish part of it with documentary evidence. That's in the book I published two years ago, The Bishops versus the Pope. It's not all there. The rest of it will be published in two years. So the first thing that John the 23rd did was hasten the calling of Vatican II he was determined to do something about it. But he was unprepared. The enemy, on the other hand, was prepared. And they had a lot of upstart theologians who were more Hegelian and Kantian and communist in their theories of life than they were Catholic and Christian to oppose them. They were the outriers at Vatican II. They had control of the press, of the magazines, they had control of the radio and of the television. And they were cited and they were paraded before the public of America, Canada, South America, everywhere, to such a degree that we Catholics here were brainwashed as we were never before, as were the Catholics of Europe. Vatican II was a failure, so they tried to say. Vatican II was a Heyday for the leftists and the radicals to establish a new type of Catholicity. Vatican II was the graveyard of Thomas of Aquin and Bonaventure and the birthplace of Teilhard de Chardin. So they were told. So for the last two or three years we have been silent while the whole Catholic world is in confusion. Have we been wrong all these ages since Bethlehem and Calvary? Has Christ been an upstart who didn't know what he was talking about when he says, I am the way and the light? Was Christ nothing more than a charlatan when he says, he who heareth you heareth me, as he pointed his finger at Peter? Well, it would seem so, judging by the press. Judging by the latitude on the part of the priests and many of the bishops. Nothing new, of course, to those who knew history. We knew that in the days of the Arians, 80% of the bishops had turned heretic. We knew in the days of the Nestorians, in the days of the Jansenists, Nearly 50% of the bishops had turned heretics. It was nothing new. There was always a Judas Iscariot, and there always will be Judas Iscariot. There was always a doubting Thomas, and there always will be doubting Thomas. Nothing new. But the damage was done. 
Here the bishops came home from their conclave, 2,400 of them following Vatican II. Ecumenism was a great war. Some of them found the hours too short for them to appear in non-Catholic pulpits to join hands with heresy. Some of them thought ecumenism meant one religion as good as anotherism. Some of them thought that ecumenism meant there is no truth except that truth which a man thinks for himself in his own mind. Some of them thought, henceforth let your conscience be your guide. If you think it right to stick up a gas station or murder a clerk, do it. Some of them disregarded not only the Ten Commandments of the natural law, but the precepts that Christ set down in the gospel as guide rules for a Christian's life. Eventually, when the confusion was at its height, when the Catholic laity became discomforted by the immoralities of some of its priests who thumbed their noses, as it were, at the Pope and his celibacy and went off and attempted marriage, at bishops who did the same thing. Some of them succumbed to the thought that the sacraments are no longer necessary because there's no more sin on the basis of let your conscience be your guide. And here you poor people with whom we sympathize, we older priests, here your poor children in schools from which God had been expelled under the illegality, to my mind, of separation of church and state, with which I agree, but not separation of God and state, which is a different thing. Those pitiful days have passed because Pius VI, with his able adjutants assembled about him the brains of the church as well as representatives of the hierarchy of the church to convene in synod which ended just yesterday. This was different than Vatican II. The excessivists who had control of Vatican II, as far as the public press was concerned, were not there. Now, what did this synod accomplish? Well, first of all, it accomplished this, something that every able-bodied and minded priest knew would happen. Celibacy was upheld, not as this morning's paper says, by a slight minority, a majority. Celibacy was upheld by a 92% vote. Even Cardinal Dearden's small committee voted 16 to 2 to uphold celibacy. And the 90% of the 200 or more bishops in Rome determined with the Pope that celibacy must be the order and that those priests who refuse to accept it, let them get out of the church. You're a writer with the word employed. Let him be burned is the translation of it. We don't need them. If they do not want to follow Pope Paul VI, let them abandon the church. We can get along without them. The 
but more serious than this. There was a trend existing in the church of saying there are two types of Christianity. The old type was that the Holy Ghost came down from above, consecrated men known as priests and bishops, gave them a voice to preach the gospel, inspired them to tell the truth with the gifts of the sacraments of ordination. But one cardinal stood out above all the others and said, no, there's another type. That was the old type of Catholicity. The new type is religion comes up from below. It comes up from the hearts of the people. It comes up from the pronouncements of the people. It comes up from the attention one must give to the questions of polity, to the questions of internationalism from the people. Well, Christ, if I remember correctly, said my kingdom is not of this world. Nothing comes up from the people except obedience, except faith in the Christ who proved he was God by standing before the courts and saying, destroy this temple and in three days to prove that I'm God and my gospel is godly, I will build it up again. They forgot that as did this one cardinal. So it ended this wise. It is meaning for Paul VI, or a pope, to step down into the common rostrum, debate a subject with any of his inferiors, It is not be meaning for him to appoint someone to be his spokesman. But we were most fortunate today, we Catholics. We have in the person of Cardinal Danny Liu, a Jesuit father, elevated to the Cardinalate, a French father, noted throughout the world for the brilliance of his intellect and the holiness of his heart. So Cardinal Danielu, following October 4th of this year, chose to go to the French newspaper, the Figaro. It's to France what the New York Times is to this country and contest an article inspirited by a certain cardinal and published daily by a certain abbot whose names I'll not mention from the pulpit. And he wrote a long confrontation and argumentation that finished them. For the first time in 300 years, we had one cardinal confront another publicly because he who was guilty of tantamount to heresy chose to go behind the back of Paul VI and assail the very fundamental thought of Christianity that religion comes down from God. It's an inspiration. It started on Pentecost with the Holy Ghost giving the twelve apostles the gift of tongues, the gift of wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and so forth, to go forth and teach all men. They're the teachers, not the people. God bless Daniel you. God bless Paul the Six. God remember yesterday the termination of the citadel meeting 
which clarify the confusion of Vatican II created by the public press, by the public radio. You know, this is not a Catholic country. We never claim it to be. This is America, a country for all people. It's a country for Protestants, a country for Jews, a country for Mohammedans, yes, and a country for atheists, if you want it that way. But it's not a country where we must submit to the false theory of democracy that minority rights must take precedence over majority rights, which has been in vogue here since the days of Mr. Roosevelt. One experience is that one lady took her case before the Supreme Court to put religion out of the schools, and she, a million to one, won her case. Following October 4, a young priest notorious in Europe, as we had one from Milwaukee notorious in this country, a young priest contested every word spoken by Paul VI, contested the infallibility of the Pope, contested that religion came down from above, contested the existence of sin, contested the right of man to use his own conscience. Let that be your guide. If you say it's a sin, yes. If you say it's not a sin, no. Which gives a benediction to every trigger happy bandit who holds up a gas station. While well, this young man, who's going to appear in Detroit recent next few weeks or so, a few days, got a full page publicity in the New York Times. What a wonderful young man he is. What a wonderful modern priest he is. What a wonderful new approach to Christianity he has. Well, Cardinal Cook simply could not let that go. And he and his faculty at Madison Avenue wrote a long letter to the New York Times, the paper that's notorious for all the news that's fit to print, print you know. And they refused to print one word of it. What do we care? We're remembering the age in which we live. We're remembering the type of country in which we live. A country where those conservatives, those who are upholding the Constitution most, have been responsible for putting their benediction upon abortion, upon minority rights, taking precedence over majority rights, upon busing, upon integration of every type. And last but not least, the China incident. A little history. We Catholics and Protestants in the United States have spent close to $1,750,000,000 on supplying missionaries to China, Korea, Cambodia, North Vietnam, and elsewhere in Asia. Now we've washed all that down the drain. Some of my friends went down the drain with it. Martyrs. My classmate, Armin Jocks. Mary Noel Fox. My friends, close friends, Bishop Ford of the Marine Old Fathers, two bullet holes in the back of his head. Bishop O'Gara, who said mass here for you at the shrine in my day, came back broken, five years in tormental jail. Fifty-three million Catholics murdered! Since Vinegar Joe Stilwell and his crowd of communists in our side, our government took the part of the communists.
communists in China and betrayed the Christians in China. Mao has murdered over 50 million non-communists. Something. But we ourselves, your neighbors, have sent 350,000 American boys to the suburb of China, Vietnam, North Vietnam supplied with Chinese bullets, with Chinese planes, with Chinese murdering, and 50,000 of those boys are corpses over there. Now we're going over to take the bloody hand of that man and shake it in friendship. 50,000 bodyguards will stand on either side of the red carpet of that plane in ghostly form to say, well done, Mr. President. We died in vain. Well done. Sure, that's part of the confusion. That's part of it. While we put up with all these things against Catholicity and against Protestantism and against Christianity in this country, we, the majority, are afraid to open our mouths, but the minority crushes. When are we going to wake up? You know, long enough we've been the church timid. We've been the church obsequious. We've been the church cowardly. We've been the church silent. Since yesterday, following Cardinal Danny following the spokesman for the Pope, we're the church militant again. And if we're not, we deserve what's coming. So I come to you on this blessed day saying that the wheel of time has changed. I come to you to tell you that no longer shall your children be subjected to godless schools, because some are top, but not a page of Christianity. I come to tell you to recapture what's your own under the leadership of such wonderful priests as Father Hayes. Stand by him and all such clergymen in this country, all such clergymen in the world who will take courage from they used to call him the Lamb of the Lamb. Now he's the Lion of the Vatican. You have the voice of God on your side. And you have the citizenship of this country to seize what has been stolen from you. You've been brainwashed long enough. And you're not going to succumb to communism despite the Marshall Plans, despite the Stillwells, despite the Alger Hitlers, despite those who've sold China down the bloody river of red and are preparing to do it to you unless you stand up and proclaim yourself. This is a blessed day. It wouldn't have happened except for Pius VI. It wouldn't have happened except this cardinal whose name are not mentioned invited the repercussions of Cardinal Danny Liu, a man sent by God, the Athanasius of this time, the Athanasius of our days, who will defy the world in the name of the Christ whom he loves and for whom he dies. God bless you.
This program was produced and distributed by Keep the Faith.